Uh, good evening from uh, Miami. Uh, my name is John Quelch. I'm the Dean of the Patty and Alan Herbert Business School here at the University of Miami. And I uh, want to first of all thank the Knight Foundation for their sponsorship of the Knight Venture Leaders Series. And uh, this evening, our special guest is uh, Peggy uh, from uh, Magic Leap. Um, to introduce uh, Peggy, we have a, a very special guest uh, in addition, and that is uh, our provost, uh, Jeff Dirk, uh, who uh, previously was the Dean of Engineering at uh, Case Western University. He's an expert on MRI, uh, has around about 40 patents. I think uh, many of you on the call will know Jeff. Uh, he's done a great job for us during the uh, COVID crisis of the last year. And uh, uh, because I, 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 I'm sorry, I only uh, graduated from uh, college with a history degree, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to have an electrical engineer introduce another electrical engineer. So here we have uh, Jeff to uh, do the honors. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, John. And, and Peggy, thank you for being with us here tonight. It's my pleasure and thrill to introduce Peggy Johnson, who's the CEO of, of Magic Leap, and really thank all of you for being here as well. I think right now there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 registered guests composed of our students, faculty, staff, and alumni. And I think that speaks to our strategic plan and the strategic importance of STEM and technology, both at the University of Miami, but in South Florida as well. It's my pleasure also to, to work with John and the Business Technology and Management Science Group at the Miami Herbert Business School. You know, the program is, is in business analytics. It's one of the newer master's degrees on our campus, and it is really looking forward to ways to incorporate virtual reality into our everyday pedagogy. And I think that's one of the things that you'll hear Peggy talk about tonight. And, and Peggy knows this, and some of you know this as well, but since our partnership with Magic Leap began about two years ago, I'm happy to report that we have about 40 projects in our strategic plan to enhance learning experiences, our faculty research and scholarship, as well as our faculty artistic endeavors through the use of spatial computing and XR initiatives. And I think it's this strong collaborative efforts, not only across our campus, but with Magic Leap, we're committed to continue to expand this work with them. So Peggy, thank you for being here tonight. Now, let me give a little bit of bio of my fellow electrical engineer. As I said, Peggy Johnson's currently the CEO of Magic Leap and she joined Magic Leap in August, 2020. And I think all of you can appreciate what an interesting time it was here in August, 2020 in, in South Florida, but really the responsibility to lead the company into its next phase of growth and development really represents a unique opportunity, not only for the company, but for the entire planet in, in this mixed reality type of environment. So prior to joining Magic Leap, Peggy was EVP of Business Development at Microsoft, where she was responsible for driving strategic partnerships to accelerate growth. And Peggy, I hope we can do the same thing together between Magic Leap and us at University of Miami. She also worked at Qualcomm and Wireless Tech and Innovation for 24 years, where she served as a senior member of Qualcomm's executive committee. And during her time there, she held various leadership positions across engineering, sales, marketing, and business development. We already heard that she earned her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, and it was from San Diego State University. And today she represents the US on the US Pacific Economic Cooperative Business Advisory Council. In addition, she serves as a board member for Live Nation Entertainment. So without further ado, please welcome my fellow electrical engineer, Peggy Johnson to University of Miami. Thank you so much, Peggy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Provost. And thank you, Dean, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here virtually with all of you and looking forward to the conversation this evening. Well, Peggy, uh, thanks very much. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that our president, Julio Frank, is uh, also on uh, with us uh, in the audience, uh, underscoring the, uh, the special relationship that we have with Magic Leap. And uh, our new uh, Dean of Engineering for Team Bishwash is also with us. And uh, we're really delighted that he joined us in January from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, let, let me start off because not everybody, I think, uh, uh, who's uh, in the audience is necessarily familiar with 
uh, magic leap as uh, as we are as leaders of the university. So, you know, what is magic leap and what what's the technology that everybody's getting excited about? Right. Uh, good question. So we are a spatial computing company, and essentially, it's um, we're looking to merge your digital and your physical worlds together. So magically produces a device, it's a headset. And when you look through the device, you still see your physical world, but we augment it with digital content, useful digital content. And that could be a variety of modalities. It can be video, text, um, images, and you can interact with the content. So we are a, we're a little bit different maybe than some of the products that you see on the market that are uh, maybe more of a heads up display. Digital content is fixed. Ours can, um, as you move around, we actually put it into a certain spot in your, in your physical view. And there's uh, quite a few enterprise applications that are associated with that kind of technology. So uh, help help, uh, help it uh, come alive for us. Can you give us two or three examples of applications that the uh, the folks in the audience would be able to relate to? Absolutely. One that we're super proud of. Uh, it was done in conjunction with UC Davis out in California, and it was associated with there was a, a set of conjoined twins, and you know that's a to the separation surgery that goes around that is highly complex. Every move in the operating room is typically choreographed. And the 30 person surgical team trained using the Magic Leap device. And basically we worked with our partner named Brain Lab and they take uh, CAT scans and MRIs and they turn them into 3D images. And so they were doing that sort of thing for uh, the PC environment. And when we started to work with them, we work to integrate it onto our uh, headset. And so you put the headset on and you can all be looking at a brain, an image of a brain in 3D. You can walk around it, you can expand it. And the team actually worked on the surgical pathways that they were going to draw for the surgery. And so you can imagine this type of education process. They, they actually trained for months can really translate to a number of, of operations, whether it's hearts or spinal cord injuries or things like that. But what we're really excited about is our next generation will be um, what's called 60601 compliant. It's a type of regulation that allows you to bring the device into the operating room. So then that'll open up a, a whole plethora of new cases. Uh, but that's one example. Another one is frontline workers. Uh, these are typically the the first person you see at many businesses, maybe they sit at the front desk, um, they might be a factory worker. Many of them uh, might not have access to a PC. And we see their world expanding by having essentially what is a PC on their eyes and empowering them uh, more than, than perhaps a shared PC in a corner that many are using. Uh, so one example is, is um, factory workers. Uh, they may be new to a line uh, in, rather than sitting in a room for three weeks training on the machinery, you can actually put them out on the factory floor, put the headset on, and you can walk them through processes, maintenance, that sort of thing. Uh, and they're hands free. So they have their hands available to actually make changes to the machinery. So it's that type of empowerment that I think uh, we can bring to frontline workers and they may not have had access to something like that previously. So, so two very good examples. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, Magic Leap uh, um, focused uh, early on on the consumer market, uh, but now I believe that, as you yourself implied, you've moved towards an enterprise focus. So can you explain, please, the uh, strategic uh, shift and uh, why, why that's important and will eventually Magic Leap again uh, be addressing consumer markets directly after it uh, conquers the enterprise space? Yeah, so we were originally focused on the consumer market and probably some of that was because it was amazing technology, but the, you know, the team was looking for use cases and uh, it was fun to make content for sure for a consumer because it's, it's, it's attractive to be able to see something 
in front of your eyes, you know, you're, you're essentially tricking your eyes in, in, into the fact that something is sitting right there uh, with this digital content. So there were several um, forays into various areas of the consumer market. The first generation product actually launched, pointed at the consumer market. It suffered a bit from content. I think people, um, as they were trying to understand what the technology could do, the content was, was slow in coming to the device. But you know, for me, as mentioned, I had this uh, wireless industry background. It was nearly 25 years at, at Qualcomm. And I saw a similar trajectory with the mobile phone. So when we first were, Qualcomm actually made mobile phones back in the day. And when we first made a phone, you know, it was hard to tell who, who was gonna buy this. And if you remember mobile phones at the time were larger, they were more expensive. Um, they had limited use cases, but enterprise bought them. It, were, it was people uh, who worked at companies that maybe they did sales from their car. They would have to stop, park, find a phone booth to check in several times throughout the day. This device, this new mobile phone gave them the ability to stay in the car, quickly make a call and get the job done. Uh, and so it increased their efficiency. There was ROI there. There was a return on investment for companies. And that is the same sort of trajectory that I see for augmented reality. Today, right now, there's many more use cases than the two that I outline across the enterprise field. And we'll see as the product uh, expands into more and more markets, price will come down, size will come down, weight will come down. The silicon will get more highly integrated just as it did with mobile phones. And we'll see those consumer products arise and, and for sure magically um, eventually will focus again on consumer. But the early stage, early adopters right now are in the enterprise space. So how, when, when you're facing uh, as a, a senior executive, when you're facing an array of options an array of investment opportunities across multiple industries, um, how, how do you go about sorting out you know, which ones to focus on. You mentioned ROI, but how, how do you even generate the data that you need in order to make an ROI in assessment given the, the novelty of the technology? You know, it's interesting, again, I'm drawing an analogy to my time at Microsoft because I was there sort of at the beginning of the cloud wave. I was there for six years when they had just launched the Azure cloud. And I think a lot of times companies looked at cloud initially and thought, oh, I don't think I need that. I have these on-prem computers. I probably don't have to go to the cloud. They couldn't quite see what the cloud would do for them. There, had, there was an education process that, that many companies went through. And I think it's similar with augmented uh, reality. However, there are a few fields that are used to things like heads-up displays. Um, doctors do wear those in many surgeries. And, and so they're used to something head mounted. They understand the value that bringing information into that environment can deliver to them. There's public sector and defense areas that are also used to that. And manufacturing is another area that's used to that. So that's where we focus. We said, let's go to where there's already a comfort with heads up displays and show them this technology will take them to the next level. So those are the three areas we're most focused on. But I have to say, you know, this pandemic has caused an acceleration of a need for remote working solutions. And that has been a catalyst uh, in the broader enterprise space. So we have all sorts of companies that largely ones who you know, really need their teams to be together physically. Those are the ones we're, we're hearing from and they're asking, can, can you do anything to help us continue to work and collaborate in this environment when we can't physically bring people together? And this technology does that. And, and I would say in that area, the early adoption use cases are things like 3D visualization. If you've got uh, design teams who are building something, maybe typically they would have been in a room together, they can actually have that thing they're designing sitting in, in whatever room they're in. And I, I could be designing something right here with my team uh, and they could be all over the world. 
uh, training, any sort of training where you used to gather people into training rooms. Um, you can save time and money with this. So even post pandemic, I believe there will be use cases. And then, you know, any kind of collaboration in general that, you, you know, the feeling when you, you know, when you're all together, you, 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 you can sort of do a better job of certain types of collaboration and remote working. Um, certainly 2D video conferencing is fine for, for much of, of what we're doing, but to take it to that next level, this idea of 3D meetings uh, is, has really risen to the top, again, accelerated by the pandemic. So we're, we're looking at building a first party app in that space that will um, kind of expose the, the, the many different things that you can do with the technology that's just short of a physical meeting. Uh, so would it be fair to say that, uh, in your view, where we're actually not going to be going back to the old way of life uh, pre-COVID uh, with meeting after meeting face to face in a conference room, uh, that actually your technology will enable uh, the productivity improvements that have come from COVID in terms of reduced travel and so on uh, to to actually enable people to collaborate effectively without uh, having to be face to face that that's going to yeah that's spot on dean because the issue i mean i just look at my own traveling practices for the last I i've been in the tech industry for 35 plus years and i would get on a plane from the west coast and go to a two-hour meeting in new york and come back and you know i think a lot of people in the business world have very similar stories and I just don't see that happening uh, post pandemic. I think we will assess every trip and say, can a 2D meeting work? Can a 3D meeting work? And then we'll make more choices and uh, decisions not to get on those planes. And I think even in the office, we've proven that we, we can work. Um, it's a bit exhausting, you know, all day long to be on a 2D video conference. I, I sometimes, you know, feel that way at the end of a day where it's been 10 hours straight of, of um, you know, Zoom and Teams and Google Meet calls. Um, so people will be looking for alternative remote working solutions. So I believe some amount of remote work will continue and we just need to up our game in, in you know, what, how we interface with people. Sometimes a quick phone call is, is sufficient. A uh, 2D meeting might be sufficient to, to, you know, quickly gather a few people. And then other times a 3D meeting uh, is going to fit the bill. But the thing about 3D meetings that I think we really can, can look to um, expand further is that human connection you get. So I, I actually hold my board meetings, my weekly staff meetings in this uh, first party app that we're developing. And right now we're depicting uh, members as generic humans. Um, and and but because we have eye tracking on the device, I can see when someone's looking at me. So from across the room, I can see, you know, when my CFO is looking my way and and the spatial audio is amazing. If, if they walk behind me, I can hear them just as if I was in a physical room. And we're gonna continue to expand on these human connections that, that that make you feel again like you're you're actually in a room full of people. I think they're important. We're still learning about all of those, and you know maybe we'll tap into some of the talent on uh, the campus at University of Miami to help us understand, you know, what resonates with people, um, what what makes people feel uh, joyful again when when they're in a room full of people, whether they're virtual or physical. And that's an area that I'm just super interested in because it, it's going to have a lot of energy in it post pandemic, because I think we'll be looking for solutions other than uh, just our 2D video conferencing of today. Uh, a lot of people think that um, uh, it's not so difficult to connect with people you already know or make a sale to a customer who you already have, but um, trying to uh, uh, make a deal with a group of people uh, for financing, for example, whom you haven't met before, uh, without being able to, as it were, smell the room or feel the uh, the mood in the room. Um, it's not so easy. So, can can what you're doing overcome that? 
Yeah, that's a good question. And I think we're, you know, we're still working on that, to be honest, because I know, I, I mean, I'm a people person. I've done biz dev for uh, the latter half of my career. And it's important to look across the table at someone you're just meeting, look them in the eye, shake their hand, or, or whatever we'll be doing post pandemic. I don't know if we'll be doing as much handshaking or, or kissing on both cheeks. Uh, but there will be definitely um, a need for that, you know, you you do read people. You 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 read their body language. Uh, you know the way that they say things, their mannerisms, and all that comes to life in a physical meeting. So I don't know that physical meetings will be entirely disbanded. But maybe you meet someone first time, and it's face to face, and then after that, two D meetings or three D meetings suffice. And so I do think it'll be a, a mix of things and not. Uh, solely will snap to one thing. It, I, I, it, there'll, there'll be times when a 3D meeting is appropriate. There'll be times when a face-to-face meeting is appropriate. But all things that we need to study more. So uh, the provost uh, referred to the uh, projects that um, Magic Leap has with the University of Miami at the moment. So, and I think a lot of people on the call are really interested in uh, how to integrate this technology potentially into higher education. Uh, I think you've explained how that might work at a school of medicine uh, or a school of nursing uh, pretty effectively. But uh, what 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 about a college of arts and sciences? Uh, you know, how how could a professor of literature, you know, or or otherwise take virtual reality or augmented reality and uh, do something with it that would be pedagogically exciting? Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, I think. We'll continue to work on content for this device that can make various um, scenarios come to life. And, and, and rather than perhaps, uh, say, going to a play and seeing it once, you could play it again and again in your living room with the actual characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that can make various uh, areas of education come to life. Even now though, today with our product, we've engaged with a number of universities, again, calling us as we went into the pandemic, uh, particularly labs that really needed to be together to design something. So we like University of Washington has a reality lab. It's an AR VR reality lab. And they, while they had been using the devices, they hadn't been using them for their actual classroom. And once COVID started, they turned everything into interact, interactive lectures um, as, as if they were back in a physical classroom. So the things that we, they were designing in the reality lab could continue uh, from all over the world where the kids ended up going back when they went back home. Uh, so it's those sorts of things, any kind of 3D visualization, as I was saying, that uh, educators can take advantage of right now. But going forward, for instance, uh, you know, I talked about plays or reenacting historical, you know, uh, battles or whatever. You can, you can imagine uh, with very good uh, 3D volumetric capture, so putting cameras uh, around people, you can you, know, you can see your favorite artist play again, watch your favorite play, watch a symphony in your living room, I think it can, it, it will have the opportunity and the ability to expand members of the audience. They, they can be there physically if they're in that town. If you're not in town to see the Miami Symphony, you can see it from the West Coast uh, using your augmented reality glasses. Um, and that technology is also fast developing, uh, this idea of volumetric capture. The, the limiting thing about it is, if you think about it, you have to have several cameras all the way around you. Um, you know, you don't want to just have the face and nothing back there. You, you really want to get the, just as if the human was standing there. And that generally takes a fair amount of bandwidth. And uh, you can imagine that just given that not everybody has that kind of bandwidth, the experiences might not be great. But if you're in an office environment, an educational environment, and you want to replay something, it, largely will have the bandwidth, but those are the sorts of things that we have to deal with, like how to compress more, um, how to get the right camera angles that aren't, uh, you, where you don't have to go to a special studio. Is there something we can just do in our homes that will allow us to be volumetrically captured 
and then you know teleported to whoever's watching. Okay, thank, thanks, Bailey. So we've we've managed to go twenty five minutes without using the word pivot, uh, which has to be a record, um, at least in recent times. So uh, let me, for those who are feeling uh, uncomfortable, say let's pivot to another issue, uh, and that would be um, the. How, do you, how did you personally deal with uh, COVID uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, being an executive with uh, a, large, uh, a large amount of responsibility? And in addition to that, I think you even actually took the opportunity with Magic Leap during uh, the COVID period, right? So how does that work? How does, how does a company hire a new CEO in the middle of... Uh, uh, a period of time when you can't do the face-to-face -face interviews. Well, I'm not going to lie. It was a little awkward, <laughs> it, you know, because you, you really get a feel for people, as you said, to sit across from them, you know, and, and have a conversation. And all of my board interviews were done virtually. Uh, the only person I'd ever met actually was Roni Abevitz, who was the previous CEO. Yep. And I knew I knew Roni well from conferences and things. We had a, a good relationship, uh, but I'd, I'd never met any of my management team. Um, it was all uh, just a little bit strange, but, you know, not unlike what I know everybody on this call, you know, has gone through as far as, wow, how do we do this now? <laughs> Everything is via, uh, you know, our screens at home. And, and, um, and, you know, I, 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 I made it work. I wanted to make sure that I had time with people. Uh, sometimes I would just call on my phone and maybe I'd be out for a walk and just be able to spend time with people without sort of the pressures of looking at each other. Uh, there's, there's that, that could be exhausting, I think, for others. And so I got to know several of my management team that way. And then, of course, as soon as, you know, I felt comfortable, I, I did travel to headquarters um, and, and have done so several times uh, since August and were able to meet a few of my team, uh, now most of my team except for two, uh, in person. And, and that was just wonderful to be able to do that. Uh, but you know, we make things work and um, we, you know, we just use the forms of communication that we had <laughs> to get by. How, how, is, uh, how is Magic Leap as a company and its employees uh, handling the challenges um, presented by the uh, COVID crisis in terms of uh, uh, remote work and what percentage of people are coming into the office at this point? Uh, uh, how do you see that evolving? Um, could you talk yeah. to, uh, to those issues? Yeah, you know, and I should start by saying the company, when I came in, had gone through a very challenging period. Um, they had, you know, they had launched Magic Leap One, a fantastic device into the consumer market. And it, and it had, there hadn't been a lot of uptake of it. And again, there was a lack of content and a few other issues, but, but the device was, was amazing. You know, what it, what it could do was amazing. And the company had to make that pivot, use the word that you brought up. And, um, they went through some some challenging times and then the pandemic hit on on top of it and so when i came in they were kind of still dealing with with the first challenge and then they had the challenge of the pandemic as well and so i spent a fair amount of my time i had a, like a 30 60 90 day plan the first 30 days was all about the employees i needed to understand their mindsets um you know how they were feeling about the company, uh, about our, our prospects, our future focused on enterprise now. Many of them, uh, you know, had come to the company understanding it was a consumer company. And so I had to do, you know, a bit of a, a, of a reset there and a cultural shift. Uh, so we, we spent a lot of time on that. It's, and it was very, very important. It was good time spent. And, and then I was going to get to the business issues, but initially it was all, all about the employees. But the, the company has never really shut down during the COVID era because we have that factory. Uh, it's two floors, all, all the engineers and the team sit upstairs and then the factory is downstairs. And they continued to work in a safe manner, but we had people coming in and still do about 25% of our uh, thousand person workforce come in. And they, um, 
you know, continue to make, we make engineering units right now. We're right in between products. We're getting ready to uh, launch our Magic Leap 2 device. Um, it'll launch in Q1 of next year and then to early adopters in Q4. But we we have to keep working, right? We, and it's a physical product. And so we've we learned how to, you know, space people the right way to, to run folks in shifts through the factory uh, to make sure we, we took the highest precautions about everything. And um, I think the teams have done a very, very good job of um, what was a challenging situation. And, and right now we're just uh, making plans. What does uh, our post-pandemic workplace look like? And it'll be some form of hybrid work. We, we will likely not go back to 100% of the people come in 100% of the time. And, uh, and frankly, I think that flexibility is important for our employees. I just think back on my own career, I would have enjoyed a little flexibility. And when, when I was having, you know, we have three children and when I was having my kids, it was always a juggle. I would go in the early shift, my husband would go the late shift. He was also an engineer and it, it, it was a constant juggle. And uh, it would be nice to have that sort of flexibility that we can present. So I wanna continue with that. In, in some fashion. And I think that will be important for our employee base. Uh, just turning to the uh, demand side of the equation again, uh, how do you see um, AR evolving over the next uh, five years? Um, and do, I, I'm curious because um, in industrial or business to business marketing uh, in the high technology space, it's often the case that uh, uh, forward-thinking tech companies uh, work with, quote, lead users. In other words, lead users, uh, specific customers who are themselves on the cutting edge. And it's almost like a, a technological collaboration to develop the, uh, the innovation uh, that is then going to go into the marketplace and be demanded by uh, initially these lead using companies. Is that how it's working for uh, AR and Magic Leap? You know, it is. It's a it's a new groundbreaking technology. And so when we select our early users, our early adopters, if you will, it has to be companies who are open to using new groundbreaking technology. And it's really interesting. I saw a stat the other day, I think it was from Forrester Research, and it said something like 70% of the companies that were on the Fortune 500 list, I think it was 20 years ago, are gone now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and a lot of times you trace back what happened and it it was a company who had, you know, some recipe if you will for and, and they were making money with that recipe and uh they ended up never changing that recipe. <laughs> that <laughs> I think is the problem with a lot of companies and and technology often is the new ingredient into that recipe, but you know, companies that resist that tend to be the ones that have fallen off that list. And I saw that firsthand at Microsoft with cloud. So, you know, it, it was interesting. We would bring cloud into a sector, say the financial sector, and a financial sector, obviously, a lot of privacy, security, and oh, we can't go to the cloud. But then the first one, two, three companies who had an open mind about it that adopted cloud were the ones that got the ball rolling for the rest of that sector because then the others yes. said, I better do that. And, and, you know, they went to embrace it. Some were too late and some, some you know, missed the whole cloud evolution and may not be here and may be gone already, you know. So it's, it's the type of groundbreaking technology that companies need to keep their eye on. They need to understand it and they need to see if there's a use case right now that they can apply it to so that, when it becomes even more broadly available, um, you know, they're trained up on it. They understand the power and the leverage that, that this type of technology can do. I think actually just one more on that topic. If you go back, say 40 years or so, and you look at what were other groundbreaking technologies, we had the PC and the GUI interface, you know, companies that adopted that early tended to advance their own businesses, whatever those businesses were. And then we had, mobile phones with voice and touch. And if you adopted that, you, you tended to, you know, add efficiencies to your business and, and again, take your businesses to the next level. I believe spatial computing 
is the next generation of, of computing, this idea of your digital and physical worlds merging. And, and companies need to be mindful of that. Um, I mean, you don't hear the big tech companies talking about this tech for nothing, like, you know, Tim Cook, Satya Nadella, my old uh, boss, and uh, even Mark Zuckerberg the other day on the the app Clubhouse, he was talking about AR and he, there was also another article uh, about his views on AR and the information just the other day, a podcast, I think it was. And he, you know, he talks about this idea of teleporting and not transporting people. And so definitely there's, there's momentum in the space. So, so I'm interested, you mentioned uh, Clubhouse because uh, uh, I was claiming to be the oldest member uh, of the clubhouse until recently, I, I found that I had been trumped by someone else. But uh, <laughs> uh, anyone anyone who's on this webinar who is not familiar with that app, uh, it's really an exciting new audio podcast app uh, uh, with a lot of great conversations going on on a pop-up pop basis. I really encourage you to check it out. Um, the, the question I had though was, um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, is famous for uh, his book, The Tipping Point. And usually these technologies do not progress in a linear fashion. The demand does not increase in a linear fashion. There's usually a tipping point and um, suddenly everything really takes off. Um, how far are we away from that, do you think, um, in uh, the spatial computing arena? You know, in some sense, this pandemic has been a tipping point because AR has been around for quite some time. Going back to my Qualcomm days, I worked on a program called Euphoria. It was mobile AR. Uh, it's owned by PTC now, a company in the industrial space. And clearly HoloLens at Microsoft has been around for a while. Um, Magic Leap's been in the space for 10 years. And sometimes you need something that an outward um, influence that highlights what a technology can do. And that's the spark that gets it moving. So in some sense, this pandemic is that catalyst for mm -hmm. augmented reality. And then now, now the job that we have is to prove what are the use cases that can get the most value out of it. So, so we have a company training um, uh, their new employees from home now, when they used to fly them all in into a meeting room and keep them there, you know, pay hotels and meals and all that. So they're training them from home now um, with the, the device and they're projecting they'll save millions a year. So any other company in that space who's spending a lot of money training in some fashion is gonna look to them and say, I've got to have that. So there's, the ball has just started to roll, put it that way. And I, I believe, you know, now in the post-pandemic world, with less travel, we're really going to see it take off the trajectory of that. Great. Uh, so I want to encourage uh, folks on the call to uh, please send in uh, some questions via the Q&A function, uh, and I'll get to those in a moment. But uh, um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about uh, what you know of South Florida and its potential as a, a technology hub. And, um, you know, I remember uh, talking to uh, Ronnie Abowitz about uh, his determination to keep Magic Leap in uh, South Florida and not uh, um, not cave in to all of the folks who were telling him, hey, you've got to move to Silicon Valley if you want to make anything out of this company. Uh, what, what's your impression of the uh, potential of South Florida as a newcomer to the area? Well, I, I love it. Uh, of course, be, uh, being a long time, uh, the company being a long time resident there, uh, it's good for us. I think it's great to have the energy and the momentum that's out there right now. Um, it's, you know, there, there, there is a new pressure on us in that the labor pool, <laughs> there's a lot of people there in South Florida. And so the labor pool is tight, uh, which is a good thing for the university because they'll keep, uh, you know, graduating engineers and business people that we need. But it's, I have to say, I was unaware of that energy um, until I started to look at this role. And as I did, that was last summer. As I did, I realized so many folks I knew from Silicon Valley had, had moved there. And I, I, I somehow had missed that. <laughs> and then the more I looked at it, I was like, 
there's something interesting going on in South Florida. So it's my awareness of that really only started when I started looking at, at Magic Leap because I had been to Magic Leap. I visited in 2018, I think it was. Uh, Roni had asked me to come out and uh, have a tour of the factory. And um, I remember thinking, wow, uh, they're not there at the time. There's not much tech here, you know, coming for our, I lived in Seattle. Uh, obviously, before that, uh, California was Silicon Valley. And and that's completely changed in the space of two years. It's it's unbelievable what's happened. And it's wonderful for the region, the area. We're proud to be there. We're going to stay there. And I think um, it, it also just proves that tech and innovation can happen anywhere. I think for too long, people thought you had to go to Silicon Valley. I even remember when I was uh, working at Qualcomm years ago, if a startup started in San Diego, they felt the need to, to go, you know, that whatever it is, uh, eight hours north to, uh, to Silicon Valley, and they would leave San Diego. So these promising startups felt they couldn't uh, they couldn't reach their goals, their ambitions in San Diego. I think all of that has has gone out the window now uh, when when these hubs like South Florida are proving you absolutely can. Um, you don't need to be in one area with high rents and, and lots of traffic and all that. You can be, uh, you know, you could literally be anywhere in the country now. Okay, so we, we have uh, a number of uh, students, I'm pleased to say, on the uh, call from uh, uh, Professor Major's uh, strategy class, among others. Um, and a, there's one, one group of uh, questions that uh, surround the issue of what advice would you give to uh, someone who's coming through uh, a business program who um, in one case does have an engineering background, but in another case uh, does not. Um, looking back on your own experience, uh, your early career in terms of the experiences you had, the internships you had, the, uh, uh, the first job or the second job, uh, what, 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 what advice would you give uh, young people today who are obviously facing a pretty challenging uh, job market? All right, I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, I was lucky enough to have obtained my engineering degree, worked for several years in the discipline, and then moved over in, into the business side. I didn't have an MBA. I still don't have an MBA. At the time, I thought about it, but I'd had my first child and I, it was too, I couldn't juggle one more thing. So I ended up not getting an MBA. But what I did get was business experience. I sought out, you know, mentors, uh, people who could help sponsor me, who could help me get, who could help me learn. I remember going to a manager saying, I don't understand, we were making uh, cell phones. And I, I said, I just don't understand the manufacturing process, how supply chains work. And they said, come work here. <laughs> so I did. I went and, and, and transferred into the group for about six months to get that kind of a background that I, I didn't have. I would just say, be a lifetime learner. Um, if you don't have a technology degree, you can still learn. There, we, we have such a plethora of um, information online now that you can learn. You can ask to be placed into areas that'll give you exposure to the tech world. And it's if you don't have a dual degree like I did it, um, you can always reach out and, and get that information and, and ask for opportunities in those areas that you have little experience in. That's what I did. I, I tried to wear as many hats as I could by seeking out things. I, I remember I raised my hand to go into sales and I, I was in sales for about a year, I think. Didn't love it, but I learned. <laughs> I, I'm not a like a natural salesperson. But I did learn about the sales process and what it took, you know, to, to win a customer over and, and to, to maintain and sustain a customer. And it, that has been invaluable for my career to have had that. So I would just say, seek out the areas, the gaps that you have, uh, because the information's there and the opportunities are there. And that's what I did to, to kind of come up with a very well-rounded uh, background and career. And so then when I made the big moves, I felt capable and equipped, and um, and you can too. Okay, 
A uh, couple of uh, slightly more technical questions. So uh, what's the relationship between AI and AR? And you know, what role will AI play in the development of AR? Uh, and then a second question, um, what's the current status on cloud adoption at Magic Leap and how has cloud helped accelerate uh, the development of solutions? So AI and AR will have a very tight link. I would say we're probably not leveraging it enough yet. And, and for instance, in one area that I think we could really figure out uh, some interesting solutions is this going back to this idea of uh, 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 volumetric capture. So if that burden of data with all these cameras on you is just too much, I think there's things that you can do with AI by having a, uh, you know, an algorithm that has studied your facial movements and, for, and then in combination with uh, perhaps your words and, and uh, some of the other modalities that we have access to, eye gaze, uh, head pose, we know when your head is turning certain ways, I think we can recreate um, an avatar, a very real looking avatar, uh, versus having actual cameras on you and actually creating uh, you know, a real-time live stream of you. That's one area I think we can, we can definitely leverage a bit more uh, going forward. And then on cloud adoption, um, Magic Leap has moved to the cloud in certain aspects of the company and we are getting ready to move more and more of our workloads into the cloud. It's absolutely going to be necessary to do um, this idea of remote rendering and a lot of the compute that's needed. For instance, if there's a, a CAD design, you know, you have some civil engineers working on a, something and they're, they're trying to design something using a CAD program. You need the power of the cloud so that all of them can be manipulating that design at once. And that's the sort of use cases that, that open up when we can be fully reliant on the cloud. So we're moving in that direction. Um, much of the company has moved over and we're just you know, trying to get the rest over as fast as possible because it will open up more and more use cases for us. So here's another uh, enabling technology question. How dependent is uh, um, AR, VR on 5G uh, mm. to make it work and um, how, how swiftly is that going to come into uh, our daily lives, do you think? So it can work without 5G, but it can really work, uh, it can open up quite a few use cases with 5G. So 5G, think of it, it allows you to have uh, compute at the edge of the network. So uh, if you are, for instance, um, an oil pipeline or something, you know, where there's you're, you're, um, you're not near um, a lot of uh, compute processing, you can rely on the 5G network. It's high bandwidth. Uh, it can quickly take data back to the nearest facility where compute sits and send it back. That's, those are the sort of use cases that really have a lot of uh, symmetry with what AR can offer. So you, so we want, we have, we need a lot of compute in AR because we're recreating digital images in front of your eyes, and you, you want to be able to use this in a mobile environment. So you want to be able to use it. In our, we're not tethered to a PC, and so we want to be able to use it wherever we're at. Having the power of 5G, those that big low latency, high bandwidth that 5G can offer out at the edge of the network. Uh, is going to really open up some interesting use cases for enterprises and for consumers eventually, too. Um, so this question follows naturally from that uh, last sentence. Uh, which use case do you think is the one that's really going to tip uh, the market in favor of uh, widespread consumer adoption? So, you know, I used to really be centered on gaming uh, because obviously games really come to life. I think Facebook's Oculus has showed that in VR, um, that that's a fun and exciting experience. And then AR takes it to the next level because it's actually your world that you're seeing, you know, the, the, the elements of a game uh, embedded in. But I now 
I think it could be this idea of 3D meetings. I do feel like that, that is as much an enterprise use case as a consumer use case. You know, my daughter lives in New York. I'd love to be able to just talk to her, uh, you know, in a more natural fashion than having a Zoom call. And, and 3D meetings can do that. So I think there's going to be quite a bit of um, tailwind behind this idea of 3D meetings. Again, COVID uh, catalyzed, but um, that as, as well as gaming, gaming will be, um, and you know, entertainment will be the other uh, use case that consumers will want to adopt. Having your, your favorite artist in your living room, you know, holding a concert, that's the, you know, the holy grail. Okay. Uh, there are cu a couple of questions on uh, competition. Uh, so one, one question, a slightly cheeky question is, uh, you know, when will Zoom be acquiring Magic Leap? Uh, <laughs> uh, and the second question is, um, who do you see as your main uh, competitors? Um, is, yeah. it the fa is it the Facebooks and the Microsofts or is it um, white space that you're operating in? Yeah, so on the second one, the definitely, um, I would say, our main competitor is, is likely HoloLens because they're also focused on enterprise, this sort of premium enterprise experience that uh, augmented reality can give you. Um, it, it, augmented reality and virtual reality, by the way, are, are quite different in that uh, augmented reality is just very hard. <laughs> it's very hard to appropriately and precisely place digital content in your physical world and have your eye think that. You know, I can place content right here on my desk as well as across the hall. And my eye has to believe both of those use cases where virtual reality, you're fully occluded. And, and there's use cases for that too, but it's it's a different type of a, of a use case. So, so in that category, that enterprise AR category, it's largely just HoloLens that we see. There's some narrow enterprise use cases in those other devices, but it's largely largely just HoloLens. And then, oh my goodness, I forgot the first question. I shouldn't have jumped. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm afraid it was about Zoom. Uh, Zoom, and, uh, yeah, the... I should have just forgot that one, yeah. So I, what I will say is, if you look at comments, public comments by all of the, um, the video conferencing platforms that we're using, they all talk about this idea of 3D meetings and, and having some kind of AR, VR in their future as their next generation, which I love because it means that everybody gets it, you know, how, how these type of technologies can augment this 2D, very flat experience we have right now. Um, so I like the energy in all those, those spaces. Um, and, you know, obviously with us, we're building our own first party app um, but it would be wonderful to partner with any of those or all of those because I think it it can be a that that can be an option as an experience. As I said, sometimes it's a phone call, sometimes it's a Zoom meeting, and then other times you want a 3D meeting. And there's going to be reasons for each of those at different times. Uh, building on your uh, experience at Qualcomm, uh, how do you see competition with uh, China? in the uh, IT sector generally, and in particular with respect to AR, uh, are we in the US ahead of China in this uh, technology? You know, it's interesting. We are starting to see more devices uh, coming out of China. Many of them are um, what I call mobile AR. So you hold up your mobile phone and, and you see the augmented um, view on the other side. and uh, so a little bit different category than us, but more broadly, I would say, you know, China will continue to um, do what they do best, which is they, they're innovating. They're innovating right alongside us. I think we're both, there's some areas maybe where the U.S. has some advantages, some areas where China does. But again, for me, being in the AR space, I think any resources, attention, focus is a good thing for uh, the overall discipline, because uh, it kind of, you know, languished for a while until, you know, you get this spark and then everybody's jumping in and we're going to see uh, the outcome of 
all of these uh, players much sooner. You know, you get competition going, and it's 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 actually a good thing for the the entire uh, field of AR to have more people in there. Um, you know, for a long time, it was it was magically alone in the field of AR. Uh, so the competition actually is is welcome, and I think um, it's great to have just sort of diverse views on what to do with the technology. And, and, and so, you know, obviously watching all spaces carefully, but some great innovations coming out of China for sure. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try and sneak in two or three questions here uh, from the last batch that came in. Um, uh, one question is, uh, how do you see AR being applied to the driverless auto sector? Uh, yeah. A second question refers to Bluescape uh, competing with Magic Leap. How could they coexist or benefit from each other? And then a third question, uh, which I think is a very interesting question. Um, how will people be able to interact with uh, the AR that Magic Leap is offering to, in real time, input their own data uh, and uh, use other digital tools to uh, engage and co-create the experience, if you like. Yeah, and then interacting. Okay, so the first one on driverless, I think there's quite an opportunity to do more in that space. Um, I, I actually, I think even all of the uh, devices in cars now can all be done uh, virtually. And, and I think the same way, by the way, in, in airplanes, you know, airplanes tend to have a very slow upgrade cycle on their avionics. This technology can take the place of it. You can have the latest and greatest in airplanes uh, rather than some, you know, 20 year old device that, you know, you're going to upgrade someday. I so I think both any, any vehicles can benefit from this um, both the operator of the vehicle or whoever, you know, it's driverless, but whoever is, you know, maintaining the vehicle can benefit because you can see, for instance, when maintenance is needed and that sort of thing in this, um, in this heads up area, as well as the passengers who are going to have a lot more time to, to be distracted and they don't have to look at the road. They can be working, they can be, be being entertained. This is the perfect technology for that. You can just you know, jump in and have the ability to um, have a an, have an, uh, digital experience in, in a driverless vehicle in such a way that um, you know, you perhaps, perhaps we, you know, I do think the device itself will end up being sort of in a glasses form or even in contacts eventually. So if you think of any space like inside of a vehicle, we can augment it with any number of screens. You know, you don't need a, your physical laptop with you to open up and, you know, be normally maybe you're sitting in the back seat of an Uber or something, you can work. But now you can just be hands free and, and call up, uh, you know, any number of, of uh, screens around you. And that's the beauty of the technology. It goes, you know, from your physical screen to a number of screens. Um, on the interactivity, I think we are, uh, we've put ourselves into a category that because of the compute we have on board, that we can interact more with the digital content than say just a heads up display where you're just viewing digital content. So we want to be able to um, allow that in consumer and enterprises and, and enterprises have a lot of uh, ISV, you know, software vendors that they're using that are part of their workflow. Our intention is with our open uh, platform and open APIs to be able to connect to those things. So for instance, if you were using some kind of um, uh, business uh, package, you know, uh, that's business doing some sort of analysis, you can plug into that and it'll come alive in a 3D manner. Uh, and that's, that's sort of the next uh, level of interaction that we, we want to be uh, bringing to our enterprise customers so that they can interact with this technology, with whatever they're using today already. And so we, that we've built our platform to be open. And then the last one, I'm actually not familiar with Bluescape, and that's probably my bad. <laughs> so. All right, let's let, let's skip that one and finish up with you know uh, two two perspectives from uh, two different uh, 
uh, audience members, but you know, both both provocative, I think. So picking up on a, a point that you made earlier when you were talking about uh, uh, the simple phone call uh, that you make to uh, occasionally when you're out walking to uh, one of your colleagues, um, to what extent is uh, the AR mode of communication going to just completely wipe that out or will there still be the occasion when a simple phone call will be the preferred mode of communication, at least for some people. And then the second question, uh, uh, picking up, uh, I apologize, picking up on the Zoom issue one more time. Um, someone suggesting, I think quite provocatively, that uh, Zoom is going to become uh, the blockbuster uh, equivalent uh, to you as the equivalent of Netflix. Uh, in other words, <laughs> Magic Leap is the equivalent of Netflix, which uh, would make all of your investors very happy to hear, I'm sure. But uh, do, do you have a, a final thought on each of those two before we close? Uh, final thought, the simple phone. I think we will, I, I, AR won't replace that simple phone call in the near term, but in the longer term, again, when, I, when maybe we're wearing simple glasses or contacts, it would. So I don't think you you, you know you're going to pick up the simple phone because it's easy and you know how to uh, very quickly contact someone. Until we can replace the ease of that experience with AR, I don't think one will take the place of the other. Um, but I, but there will be a time when it it will because we you know when the technology gets smaller, lighter in in a form that can go into a contact or your glasses, then then we could do something like that. And on the Zoom one, well, I love that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Keep <All right>. up. <laughs> I think I think that's a good enough answer. So, uh, you know, thanks uh, so much, Peggy. We wish you every success in the new role. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this evening, and uh, was really a fascinating, stimulating, and very informative conversation. And uh, I appreciate it so much. And uh, thanks for all you're going to do and are doing with the University of Miami as well. Uh, so. With that, thank you, Peggy, and uh, good night from Miami. <laughs>